Thank you, David, um, and to the Cato Institute for having me here today. Um, it is a pleasure uh, to come and speak, especially to this group, about a case that I think represents one of the most important decisions on individual rights and the appropriate limits of government in the past half century on the Supreme Court. Um, I am Dale Carpenter. I teach at the University of Minnesota Law School in the areas of constitutional law, the First Amendment, and um, sexual orientation and the law. I also should tell you at the outset that I uh, co-wrote with Eric Jaffe, who is a former clerk for Justice Thomas, an amicus brief um, for Lawrence and Garner in Lawrence versus Texas. And as David mentioned, uh, the Cato brief was an, an incredibly influential brief in uh, Justice Kennedy's uh, decision, deservedly so. Uh, Justice Kennedy's decision relied on many amicus briefs, in fact. Um, I think all of the amicus briefs, one in one point or another, except the one that I contributed uh, to, the, to the opinion, but it was um, uh, definitely striking for the amount to which it relied on these, um, uh, on these briefs, not just from the Lambda legal attorneys, but from outside sources as well. That was itself part of a deliberate strategy on the part of Lambda Legal, who led the way into the Supreme Court from the lower Texas courts to show a broad-based opposition and critique of laws like the so-called homosexual conduct law in Texas, which forbade specified sexual activities if they occurred between two people of the same sex. The decision that resulted from Lawrence versus Texas, from that litigation, is as close to a Brown versus Board of Education for gay men and lesbians as we, are, as we have had so far. Uh, certainly the most important decision yet, a landmark decision for the rights, at least, of gay men and lesbians. Yet very little, I think, is known about the actual background of the case and the events that led from a bedroom arrest or an apartment arrest to the Texas courts to the Supreme Court. And that is the story that this book tells. Over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I can't recount every one of those stories. Uh, there isn't the time. And in addition, I want you to read and buy the book. Um, it is available um, right outside, and I'm happy to sign the books after all of this is over. So I, I hope um, that I can just tease you enough into buying this so you won't read all of these wonderful reviews and feel like that's a substitute for actually picking it up. There's, there's more in there. The, um, the Texas statute at issue was passed in 1973 by the Texas legislature. It was the end product of a process of revision over a period of 120 years in Texas, a process that paralleled changes in American law in general, such that the state moved from banning the crime not fit to be named, as uh, Sir William Blackstone once called it, a crime against nature, to a crime that specified certain kinds of sexual acts between certain people. By the time it reached its refined stage in 1973 in Texas, it forbade both oral and anal sex between two people of the same sex, but it allowed identical activity to occur between two people of the opposite sex. That same year, in Texas's comprehensive revision of its criminal code, the state saw fit to de decriminalize adultery, to decriminalize seduction on promise of marriage, and even to decriminalize bestiality, which means that as of that year, Texas declared its public policy that it was permissible for a person to have sex with an animal but not to have sex with another person to whom you had committed your life and for whom you were responsible. That statement by itself was a powerful one. And while the law was styled and titled a conduct law, a homosexual conduct law, I believe that the effect of that law and of similar sodomy laws around the country 
was to effectively criminalize not just conduct, but the very status of being a gay person in our society with consequences that suffused every area of the law, as I'll mention a bit later. Um, I came to write this book when I tried to write a law review article for the Michigan Law Review right after the decision came down and decided I needed to write a factual background section to the law review and realized when I read the decisions that there was no factual background available. If you look at the decisions of the courts, including the Supreme Court, you get at most a paragraph that says uh, Harris County police entered an apartment where they saw two men engaged in sex that violated the state sodomy law, so-called, took the men to jail. They challenged their arrest under the Constitution's Equal Protection and Due Process Clauses and ultimately succeeded in Justice Kennedy's opinion. And I thought there had to be something more to the case than that in the background. For one thing, I was trying to get tenure and I needed to write longer articles. <laughs> so I started calling around to my friends in Houston, whom I'd known since the 1990s when I lived in Houston, in fact lived there when these arrests occurred, and who I knew from my own political activity, my political involvement at the time, both in the Republican Party and in the gay civil rights movement. And um, I uh, just assumed that the police had seen what they said they had seen, and that's the way I began my question with that assumption built in to one of these civil rights leaders who stopped me over the phone and said, now, Dale, you're assuming that the police saw them having sex and that they were having sex. And I paused for a couple of seconds to let that sink in. And I said, well, of course I'm assuming that. That is the, what everyone believes about the case. And that was the basis for challenging the Texas homosexual conduct law and these arrests. And he responded, well, I think you need to do some more digging. So that got me thinking that there might be more to this case. How is it that police end up on the threshold to a bedroom and observe two people having sex. Didn't they announce their presence? Didn't they knock on the door? Wasn't there time to disengage before the police actually saw anything? These are the kinds of questions that had no answer and that I was trying to seek out. As I started digging around, I tended to get one of two kinds of answers from civil rights activists down in Houston and from lawyers who had represented Lawrence and Garner. One kind of answer said to me, yes, that's right, there is a lot more to this, and in fact, we believe they weren't having sex. And the other kind of answer, especially from the lawyers, was we don't talk about that. And of course, as soon as I heard that, I knew I had a story. And the question is how I was going to get it and whether I could fit it into a larger narrative about what made that fact important, why it might have mattered that the police could walk into the home of a private citizen and arrest the people found inside for doing nothing. So I interviewed uh, the police, three of the four police who were first on the scene. I ultimately was able to interview Lawrence and Garner themselves, although initially at least the lawyers would not let them answer questions about what they were doing inside the apartment. I interviewed activists who were close to the case. I interviewed law clerks, uh, people who were working for the judge whose uh, uh, court the case ended up in at the lowest level, the Justice of the Peace Court. I interviewed judges themselves. I interviewed the lawyers who crafted the constitutional arguments to get a sense of how they shaped their arguments, what sort of choices they made in deciding to emphasize certain arguments rather than others. I interviewed the prosecutor in Harris County who made decisions about what kinds of ways Texas would defend the law and what it was not willing to do in defending the law. And from all of that, I came to uh, a number of different conclusions, um, one of which is that I believe that Lawrence and Garner, in fact, probably were not having sex when the police walked into their apartment. 
Part of this is based on the sheer improbability of the story that the police tell, which I, uh, uh, which I relay in some detail in the book, uh, and which I could happily regale you with some other time. Um, part of it is based on what the men themselves did shortly after the arrest, when they were taken to jail, should say dragged off to jail, um, and uh, pleaded not guilty in response to the charges against them. And then ultimately, a year ago, this April, um, John Lawrence finally insisted to his attorneys that he be allowed to speak about the full background of the case. He knew that he was ill, very ill, and he wanted to tell his side of the story. There had never been a trial in this case because the challengers had agreed to the version of the facts alleged by the police in a 70 word or so complaint. And I got to sit down with him last Good Friday in April and he told me directly that the police barged in, that the men were either fully or partially clothed, that they were as much as 15 feet apart and were not doing anything. And I started to ask questions about um, why is it that the police would have done something like that? Well, one immediate answer is that this, can, this kind of thing could happen in any case, any time the police are present in any home. They could come up with charges that, do not, that, are, that aren't really based in fact. Uh, but there seemed to be a special reason why the police might have charged falsely in this case. And a number of those factors, I believe, were at work when they entered John Lawrence's partner uh, apartment that night. Uh, one of them is that they were certainly angry and frustrated that they had been called to the apartment on a false report of a weapons disturbance in a very complicated uh, series of events that are also described in the book. But the second, and this is very clear from my interviews of the police officers and from uh, John Lawrence and Tyrone Garner themselves, they were, uh, their homophobia was aroused. Their very idea that not any particular act was illegal, but the status of being gay was illegal and allowed people to be targeted simply for being rather than for doing. The homosexual conduct law in Texas should have been called a homosexual status law. That was revealed, for example, in the fact that um, the Harris County Sheriff's Office, which is the department that um, these officers were part of, refused to have a non-discrimination policy and had no gay or openly gay sheriffs in the department. It refused to train officers in the way that it would do for other uh, groups that the police would occasionally encounter to say, when you encounter these people, you do not call them by anti-gay epithets. You treat them respectfully and with dignity. The Sheriff's Department refused to do that. When Anise Parker, whom I also interviewed and is now the mayor of Houston, Texas, the uh, first openly lesbian mayor of any large city in the entire country, when I interviewed her for the case, she said that back in the 90s she had conducted trainings for Houston Police Department officers. And in contrast to the Harris County Sheriff's Office, it was important for the Houston Police Department to actually learn about the communities they were policing and to try to minimize rather than to exacerbate tensions and hostility between the community and the law enforcement authorities. And she used to open up these training sessions for these fresh recruits in the Houston Police Department by asking them, how many of you believe that it is illegal to be gay in Texas. And every single one of these recruits ra raised their hands at uh, most of these sessions. It had somehow seeped into them that this very status was illegal, that you didn't really, you could assume that some illegal conduct had occurred, write whatever you wanted to on an offense report and expect that it would be believed or indeed that it would never be challenged because of shame and because of stigma. So that is one important conclusion from uh, this book. Another um, part of the book 
and this has gotten a bit less attention uh, so far at least in the reviews, but I think um, I, I would want to emphasize it uh, to this audience, is that there was a, of course, deliberate, very careful litigation strategy for presenting arguments to what is basically a conservative and incremental and pragmatic nine justice court. The arguments for um, Lambda Legal <coughs> reflected the experience of that organization and of gay rights attorneys over a period of decades. The kinds of arguments that were uh, used reflected that learning and experience. And there were certainly specific constitutional doctrines that they relied on, but both of these doctrines, main doctrines, equal protection on the one hand and fundamental rights or due process on the other, were guided by an overall narrative that applied to both of the arguments. And that narrative was this to the court. In striking down the Texas sodomy law and the laws of the other 12 states that still have similar laws, you are not leading the country. You are following the country. The country is already, has already left these laws in on the ash heap of history, and you're simply consolidating the feelings of the country as they currently exist. You don't have to strike out to declare anything very revolutionary or very new. And Lambda did this in a number of specific ways in its briefs that were quite convincing ultimately, obviously, to the justices, pointing out changes in the law and changes in our treatment of gay men and lesbians over time including in the period since Bowers versus Hardwick in 1986 when a member of the court could say to a closeted gay clerk that he never knew a gay person. That was impossible by 2003 when every justice on the court had known and perhaps had had a clerk who was openly gay. That was the basic theme of the case. Follow the country, you don't lead the country. The strategy on the other side, the strategy on the side of Texas, was not to launch an anti-gay crusade. The Harris County District Attorney did not want to sink to the level of anti-gay epithets, it said in its briefing. It did not, for example, want to rely on really unsupportable arguments about the public health justification for anti-sodomy laws the arguments that many of the amici made in their briefs supporting the state of Texas were, the prosecutor told me, basically embarrassing and silly. And they really did not think they helped the side of Texas. But Texas's main theme was that laws regulating sexual conduct have an ancient historical lineage. And they reflect the values, the morals of the people as determined by their representatives in the state legislature. And morals-based legislation is by itself enough to justify a law, unless there is some special reason to distrust the law because, for example, it is aimed at persons based on their race or aimed at some real fundamental right of which they said the activity in this case could, did not partake. So their basic uh, stream, uh, theme was judicial restraint and history. Um, those themes came before the court in a very dramatic argument in March of 2003, which was filled with advocates, mostly in favor of gay rights, people who had worked their entire lives to remove things like Bowers versus Hardwick from the law because of all of the damage they believed that had been done by that decision and by these laws more generally. Um, it, w it represented by Paul Smith, who is an attorney here in Washington at the law firm Jenner and Block, and who was known previously really for his corporate work and not for gay rights work. He was as prepared as an advocate could be before the Supreme Court and was extraordinarily effective. I was there in the courtroom when the argument was held and it was an, there was an audience there that was extraordinarily knowledgeable about all of the cases and the theories and the doctrines and 
the language that was used. The audience was hearing the language at two and three different levels at once. It was hearing the double and triple entendre in the questions that the justices were asking and in the responses that Paul Smith was giving. It had a freight train intensity about it that was almost irresistible, even as Justice Scalia and as Chief Justice Rehnquist were trying to resist and point out flaws in the argument, Paul Smith had an immediate answer to almost every question that was asked of him. Contrast that with the uh, presentation by um, Chuck Rosenthal, who was the um, lead uh, uh, prosecutor who decided to argue the case in the Supreme Court. He had never argued, as best we can tell, an appeal. Never, n n needless to say, he had never argued in front of the Supreme Court. So um, my advice, if I have any that you take away from today's presentation, is that if you find yourself in a position where you might take a case to the Supreme Court, try not to make your appellate debut <laughs> in front of the nine justices on the court. It is a very, very difficult environment in which to do that. And um, you can see, and I've, it's, it's detailed in the book, you can see how he flailed around, could not answer questions. The, ju the justices basically began having a conversation among themselves, and he was just standing there observing the oral argument that he was supposed to be intimately involved in. The decision is what the decision was. My book is not a book about constitutional doctrine, so if you're looking for a close textual analysis of Justice Kennedy's opinion, or you're looking for predictions about what the court may do in some other case in the future, you really will not find them in this case. It was important enough for me to say what happened here, how it got to the Supreme Court, and what the Supreme Court decided, and to emphasize that knowing what we now know about Lawrence versus Texas in no way diminishes or tarnishes the importance of this decision as a defense of individual rights and freedom against the power of the government. Instead, if I'm right about, the res about what happened in this case, the case was worse than we ever knew. It was not simply about a bad law or an unconstitutional intrusion on the private lives of citizens. It was about a perversion of the law, a corrupt enforcement of an unconstitutional law. It meant that gay men and lesbians could not, did not live by the same rules that the rest of us live. It's akin to having two different speeding limits for people. And that um, should be troubling to a constitutional republic that respects individual freedom.